I first met uh, Aaron in January of 2010 when he was a student on my course, History 380, American Colonies, which I'm actually teaching again this semester. Uh, I remember he quickly distinguished himself in that class, delivering an impressive report on Cabeza de Vaca, if you remember that. Uh, he was also a student in my travel course, uh, where we traveled to Boston in the summer of 2010, and perhaps indicative of where his research interests would lead him, his final paper for that class was A Land Divided, The Varying Perceptions of Land Ownership in Colonial America. In winter 2011, Aaron took my class History 480, The American Revolution, where he began researching the transnational aspects of the War of Independence, especially how it related to the Francophone populations. This became the basis for his honors thesis here at Eastern uh, about the origin of the, of the Quebec Act. In his thesis, Aaron explored the historiography and sources of colonial Canada in order to delve into important issues of ethnicity and religion as a way of understanding the complex workings of the 18th century Atlantic world. Upon graduating from Eastern Michigan University with honors in 2013, Aaron enrolled at Lehigh University in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, where he pursued his master's degree in history. His master's thesis was Revolutionary Reverence, the Politics of Memory and Identity in the Baptist Church of Post-Revolutionary Virginia. And while at Lehigh, Aaron received a multi-year fellowship to research and produce a documentary film and website that explores the evolution of the Black student voice on Lehigh's campus. He completed his MA in 2015 uh, and returned to Michigan, enrolling in, a P in the PhD program at Michigan State University. Uh, Aaron's dissertation at Michigan State was reading between imperial lines, settler colonialism and indigenous survivance in the Great Lakes borderlands. Working under the expertise of Dr. Susan Sleeper Smith, he explored the resistance strategies developed by indigenous peoples in the wake of co settler colonial tactics of Indian dispossession and removal that were enacted by both the United States and the British Empire in the first half of the 19th century. While at MSU, Aaron researched as a research fellow at Michigan's newly formed Center for Research for Indigenous Social Action and Equity. Uh, Aaron completed his PhD at Michigan State in 2021 and started as an assistant professor of history at Syracuse University just this semester. His talk today is titled Misremembered Massacre, uh, Simon Pokagon's Indigenous Account of the Battle of Fort Dearborn. Drawing on the research from his dissertation, he challenges the work of historians who have overwhelmingly drawn on white accounts to understand what happened at Chicago in 1812. It is my pleasure to introduce Professor Aaron Lutke. Thank you much, John. Um, well, hearing, hearing that sort of meta history of my path is, uh, it's jarring, you know, um, thinking about the different directions that you take throughout your career and then looking at where you wound up and wondering how point A got to point B, got to point C, eventually to where you are is, uh, ah, it's fun. Anyways, um, I want to thank everyone for being here today. Uh, I have a very special place in my heart for Eastern. Um, the history department there uh, was literally the place that I realized how, well, A, how much I loved history, but also B, um, kind of how to be an adult, right? And I think that that's sort of the case for your undergrad. Um, and then, of course, I went to Lehigh for my master's, and I learned just how difficult it is to actually be a historian. Um, uh, to be perfectly honest, the PhD was even easier than the master's because there was such a huge adjustment period. But um, it's a pleasure to be back here. It's a pleasure to be uh, presenting for you today. And I will get started now. Okay, is that working? Great. All right, <clears throat> so. I am delivering this presentation in the traditional lands of the Onondaga, the fire keepers of the Haudenosaunee, who through successive treaties with the United States have wound up ceding the bulk of their lands, but doing so in order to ensure their cultural survival. Uh, beyond merely acknowledging the fact that Syracuse University, where I now teach at, sits on the lands of the Onondaga, I'm proud to say that Syracuse actually illustrates an ongoing willingness to engage with the Onondaga and the other Haudenosaunee peoples to both address and attempt to make right the historical wrongs. Um, secondly, I'd like to acknowledge the Potawatomi peoples of Southwest Michigan, particularly the Pokagan band, um, whom this presentation is about. And the Pokagans, like all the bands of the Potawatomi living throughout the lower Great Lakes, 
were subject to a tremendous amount of pressure throughout the 19th century to cede their homelands to the United States as well. However, unlike the Potawatomi who inhabited the present day states of Indiana and Illinois, the Pokagon Band was able to negotiate a clause in the 1833 Treaty of Chicago that allowed them to avoid forced removal to Iowa and Kansas. After a long process of petitioning following the Indian Reorganization Act of 1934, the Pokagon Band finally received federal recognition by the United States in 1994, meaning that their lands are now held in trust by the US and the tribe enjoys a measure of sovereignty and governmental autonomy in the, in the present. Lastly, uh, I'd like to acknowledge my own positionality. So I'm a descendant from the Suquamish and Duwamish people of uh, the Seattle area. My father and uncle both lived on and served the tribe at the Fort Madison Reservation before they passed. And while I'm not working directly with my tribe right now, I'm seeking to continue that service uh, to the community as a scholar of Native history, more broadly speaking. So, in February of 1897, the Chicago Daily Tribune published an interview with Simon Pokagan, Potawatomi leader from Southwest Michigan. In this interview, Pokagan declared, quote, the whites have books, many books. Yes, they have books. And in those books, they tell of the Indians and what the white man writes, the white man reads and believes. They believe lies about our race, about our troubles and about our warfare with their kind, end quote. At this point in his life, Pokagan had already attained a level of celebrity typically denied people of his race as a writer, a public speaker, and a political advocate for his people. He earned fame through works like The Red Man's Rebuke, which he wrote as a scathing criticism of settler society after visiting the Chicago World's Columbian Exposition in 1893. In that work, Pokagan responded to the insidious myths of native backwardness and savagery presented by white ethnologists and supposed cultural authorities who sought to justify the dispossession of native peoples. Pokagan built a career out of writing against the narratives of settler colonialism. He subverted common tropes that celebrated American exceptionalism, civilization, modernity, progress, and Christianity. Tropes that typically disallowed native peoples a place in the nation's present or future. Pokagan constantly highlighted with the contradictions inherent in how Americans dealt with indigenous peoples. In this 1897 interview, Pokagan boldly stated, I have been taught a little in the white man's ways, and I will use what he has taught me to set my people right. Pokagan then emphasized the subject of his interview by stating, I am writing a book which will tell of the treachery of the white man. I will tell the truth as my father told me when he was middle-aged and when he was old and dying. And all the time the tale was unchanged in the telling. The book the Pokagan hinted at writing about was an account of the Battle of Fort Dearborn, widely considered at that time to be the foundational event in the early history of Chicago. While this battle had been the subject of numerous works, Pokagan's was the first to approach it from an indigenous perspective. The Battle of Fort Dearborn, frequently referred to throughout history as the massacre of Fort Dearborn, occurred at the outbreak of the War of 1812. In early August of 1812, the garrison of Fort Dearborn in present day Chicago was ordered to abandon the fort and retreat to the better defensible Fort Wayne, 160 miles to the east. When Captain Nathan Heald, the fort's commanding officer received notice that the US had declared war not to abandon the fort. However, Heald not only determined to retreat, he first promised the Potawatomi of the area that he would gift them the fort's provisions, ammunition, and alcohol in exchange for safe passage to Fort Wayne. When Heald later changed his mind and destroyed both the ammunition and the alcohol, the Potawatomi were incensed. The next day, as Heald's men evacuated the fort, they were attacked by a combined force of indigenous warriors who killed 52 of the 77 retreating American troops, traders, and civilians. Because this number included women and children, the battle went down in local, regional, and national histories as a massacre, despite the fact that it happened during a war. In 
Of course, these histories were all penned by non-native settlers and their descendants. This presentation is on what will be the final chapter of my first book, tentatively titled, Writing Against the Frontier, the Violence of Erasure and the Power of Native Survivance in 19th Century Historical Narratives. My scholarship focuses on an aspect of settler colonial violence that persists into the present day. That is the violence of erasure. Native peoples have been and continue to be erased from the public consciousness through historical narratives and popular media. However, Native intellectuals have mounted and continue to mount resistance efforts to such violence by writing themselves back into existence. In the 19th century United States, history was not simply recorded. Rather, antiquarian historians presented a narrative that reflected the values of the era, and more particularly the region. Utilizing pioneer generation family reminiscences as the basis of Chicago's foundational story, these antiquarian historians emphasize their own social standing while also justifying the dispossession of the region's indigenous inhabitants. By writing back against the settler colonial narrative, Pokagan adapted to an aspect of Western society considered beyond the scope of indigenous capabilities, the writing of history. Pokagan used this particular strategy to explain to whites that Indians did not disappear, that they were not actually incompatible with the conventions of modern American society. So my work lies at the interdisciplinary crossroads of settler colonial theory and indigenous studies. In the late 1990s and early 2000s, Australian scholars Patrick Wolf and Lorenzo Verasini provided a framework for understanding and explaining the continued effects of settler colonialism on indigenous peoples throughout North America and Australasia. Settler colonialism, argued Wolf and Verasini, is distinct from other forms of colonialism because it is based on a logic of elimination of native peoples in order to exploit their lands and resources rather than on the exploitation of native peoples themselves for labor. Settler colonialism inherently seeks to erase traces of its own existence through the monopolization of historical narratives. These narratives mythologize indigenous peoples as less than human, statically bound to the wilderness in its natural state, incompatible with a modernizing world, and thus doomed to vanish before the spread of civilization and the transformation of the wilderness to a settler agra agrarian and urban landscape. If settler society can effectively vanish its indigenous peoples, it can then manipulate the narrative to erase its own history of settler colonial violence. Critics of settler colonial theory have frequently challenged its utility based on what they see as a tendency to essentialize the native experience. They similarly charge employers of settler colonial theory with writing history as a teleological declension narrative, one in which native peoples have no chance at survival. However, Wolf was careful when he originally formulated this theory as, quote, a structure, not an event, end quote, meaning this is an ongoing process affecting native peoples in the present not merely a way to explain their demise in the past. So long as indigenous peoples remain culturally intact, however, settler colonialism cannot reach its conclusion and thus erase its existence. In the meantime, continued violence is perpetrated on indigenous peoples through settler colonial narratives of dehumanization, see mascot controversies, and erasure, see recent comments by politicians, Rick Santorum and Sean Duffy. This illustrates the ways that settler colonial structures continually seek to eliminate native peoples until they can safely and with certainty relegate them to a pre-settler past. Because of the implications of this ongoing structure of violence and oppression on contemporary indigenous peoples, scholarship that engages with settler colonial theory must be very careful to also engage with indigenous voices and perspectives. Not engaging with indigenous peoples in this process reproduces the erasure all over. So I see it as my moral obligation to employ settler colonial theory, but only for the advancement of native issues. In his 1897 interview with the Chicago Daily Tribune, Simon Pokagan indicated that he would correct the historical record by recounting his father Leopold's Pokagan, uh, Leopold Pokagan's version of the Battle of Fort Dearborn. 
Along with Simon's grandfather, Tapanabi, Leopold was present at the battle, and together they attempted to hedge the violence committed by the young, ungovernable Potawatomi warriors who were bent on the destruction of encroaching American settlers. By presenting his father's perspective of the battle, Simon sought to persuade his white audience to see the conflict as more than merely a massacre, that indigenous life, uh, indigenous loss of life more than doubled that of the Americans, and that many of the native peoples involved tried to mitigate the violence by acting on behalf of the white settlers, soldiers, and civilians. Pokagan, like so many other native authors, used his written work to make assertions of self-determination, that is, to take back the right to declare what it meant to be native. The 19th century saw the United States grow both geographically by continually expanding west onto the lands of hundreds of individual native nations and ideologically through conversations of nationalism, and national identity building. From its inception, the US sought to differentiate itself from England and other European nations by constructing a uniquely American culture with a shared sense of national identity and invented traditions. However, like everything else in the United States, this process occurred in a haphazard and contentious manner with numerous local conditions and regional identities first materializing throughout the nation to maintain a constant debate over what it truly meant to be American. Some places like Chicago in the 19th century, by virtue of its valued place as the gateway to the West, were able to speak with a larger voice than others. Throughout the world of print and in the writing of local and regional historical narratives, Chicagoans were able to assert a primacy in the ongoing debate, uh, primacy in the ongoing debate on the American national identity. Chicago was incorporated as a city in 1833, after the region's native groups all ceded their lands within the states of Illinois and Indiana. But like the rest of North America, it was originally Indian country. Before this, the Chicago area was home mostly to the Potawatomi, some bands of Ho-Chunk or Winnebago, Sauk and Meskwaki peoples. While there was a small French presence throughout the 18th century, it was with the turn of the 19th century and the establishment of Fort Dearborn in 1803 when Chicago really saw its first influx of white settlers. Most of Chicago's early chroniclers emphasized the War of 1812 as the first major step in settling the region. And the Battle of Fort Dearborn is frequently commemorated in Chicago's early historical narratives. In fact, on the Chicago city flag, which is pictured on the screen here, the first of the four red stars actually represents the establishment of Fort Dearborn, with the others being the Great Chicago Fire of 1871, the World's Columbian Exposition of 1893, and the Century of Progress Exposition of 1933. When the Potawatomi soundly defeated Fort Dearborn's retreating garrison, killing the majority of the soldiers and many of the civilians, Chicagoans were able to justify subsequent dispossession and removal of the region's inhabitants, indigenous inhabitants. This justification took place mostly in the realm of the nation's growing print culture, particularly in the nation-building project of writing official historical narratives. To that end, Juliet McGill Kinsey was the first to publish on the Battle of Fort Dearborn, setting the tone for how the event would be commemorated thereafter. Daughter-in-law of John Kinsey, the principal trader at Fort Dearborn, Juliet published two accounts, first the narrative of the massacre at Fort Dearborn in 1844, and then Waban, early day in the Northwest in 1856. Having not moved to the region until the 1830s though, Juliet wrote her narratives from the stories that were passed down through her husband's family, particularly those from her sister-in-law, Margaret Helm. When Juliet put pen to paper in the middle of the 19th century, she drew creative inspiration from the works of James Fenimore Cooper, who popularized the myth of the vanishing Indian. Like Fenimore Cooper, Kinsey romanticized the native peoples of Chicago's past by dividing them neatly into categories of good and bad Indians who faced off against one another for the fate of the region's settler population. However, because she was writing from personal experience, 
Kinsey's narratives seem to hold more cultural authority, and they help to really solidify these romanticized tropes into the minds of the reading public. Kinsey's works received wide public acclaim that stretched well beyond the Chicago area. The May 25th, 1856 edition of the New York Herald, quote, recommended it strongly to the favor of our readers, end quote. The Herald continued later on by stating that it, quote, deserves to rank with the best sketches of the sort that have as of yet been published, end quote. What began as a way to share her family's reminiscences quickly became recognized as an important work both for its literary contributions and as a key part of Chicago's historical narrative. Kinsey's accounts of the battle paint a picture of fantastic violence and heroic figures, women and men who epitomized the exceptionalism of their frontier circumstances. She also made room for good Indians who aided the rescue of many of the fort civilians who were threatened by the region's more violent natives. However, the main heroes of the story were John Kinsey and Margaret Helm, the civilian father and daughter duo who kept their cool and utilized their frontier acumen to negotiate their survival, which in turn symbolically ensured the survival of Chicago's settler society. Immediately after Kinsey's writings, other Chicago authors also began commemorating the region's native forebears as noble people who either lost while valiantly fighting against settler encroachment like Black Hawk and Tecumseh, or by recognizing the fact that the spread of white civilization was inevitable and all native peoples could do was aid the process and then retreat west. Just about every account that followed over the next 50 years used Kinsey's writing as the primary source when talking about the Battle of Fort Dearborn. Simon Pokagan, whose band staved off removal thanks to his father Leopold's leadership during the contentious 1830s, claimed he received his formal education at Notre Dame and at Oberlin College. Though records have not been found to corroborate either of these, what is clear is that he did receive some sort of Western education, be it formal or semi-formal. After Leopold died in the 1840s, Simon began a life of advocacy for his people. He constantly petitioned the government to uphold treaty promises and annuity payments. He met with Presidents Lincoln and Grant, and ultimately he received for his people a payment of over $100,000 as compensation for mistreatment by the government. In the several works Pokagan published throughout his later years, he illustrated the keen sense of his own celebrity, and he used it to further advocate for his people, but this time in the court of public opinion. Pokagan did not merely write for a white audience, he presented to them a still thriving indigenous culture believed by the dominant society to be dead. Using more than just words, Pokagan spent the last decade of his life living out the Potawatomi culture that he insisted still existed. His Red Man's Rebuke, which he handed out on birch bark paper at the Chicago Expo of 1893, was an attempt to disprove the prevailing myths of native savagery, disappearance, and inadaptability. When Pokagan wrote his version of the massacre of Fort Dearborn at Chicago, it was to subvert the violence inherent in the settler rendition of Chicago's historical narrative. Invoking Julia Kinsey's foundational narrative of the battle, Pokagan remarked, quote, the earliest detailed account I have been able to find was written by a woman who claimed that the story was told her by an eyewitness 20 years after occurrence, and she did not publish it until 22 years later. Poignantly, Pokagan argued the account was traditional when first published. In stating this, Pokagan exhibited a keen understanding of the nature of the American historical narrative, while also hinting at its overlap with indigenous modes of knowledge transference. Pokagan posed the sharp question of why the recording of settler reminiscences held historical value, while the oral histories told faithfully for generations by native knowledge bearers could be dismissed as either inauthentic or devoid of historicity. Pokagan's narrative began by mirroring other conventional accounts. He recounted the lead, the lead up to the battle, 
the warnings that Heald received and subsequently ignored, Heald's ill-fated decision to destroy the fort's ammunition and alcohol rather than uphold his promises to the Potawatomi, and the attack on the garrison's retreat. However, Pokagon's narrative shifts its focus midway through when he discussed the role of his father, who did not appear in any of the previous versions of these events. Pokagon wrote, my father, Leopold Pokagon, chief of the Potawatomi Pokagon Band, was not informed of the, of the war spirit existing among his tribe around Fort Dearborn until within 24 hours of its evacuation. He had a great reputation among the tribe as a, white counsel, as a wise counselor, and he felt in his heart, if he could reach Chicago in time, he could prevent the conflict which he knew could only result in evil to his people. In Pokagon's account, his father, alongside Chief Tapanabi, rode all night from their village in Western Michigan in order to stop whatever bloodshed they could. When they arrived, they were able to sneak several of the captive prisoners, most notably Captain Heald himself, back to their village in St. Joseph. While acknowledging the losses suffered by the garrison during this wartime battle, Pokagon chose to focus on the ways in which natives were active agents in the story. His father sought to prevent bloodshed out of a knowledge that it would lead to further justification of violence against his people. Toward the end of his narrative, Pokagon returns to the contradiction. He stated, quote, all our traditions and the accounts published by the dominant race show conclusively that the white man's dealing with our fathers was of such a character that they were made much worse instead of better. And Pokagon calls on heaven to witness that in many battles before and after the Chicago massacre, there was far less mercy and justice shown our race than our fathers exhibited toward the garrison of Fort Dearborn, end quote. Pokagon followed this point by listing a number of different massacres in which the US troops destroyed native villages, uh, crops, um, other sources of lifeways, murdered women, children, and the infirm, and quote, completely conquered and subdued the Indians, almost exterminated them, end quote. And yet the Battle of Fort Dearborn was still commemorated as a massacre. A year before this interview took place, Pokagon gifted to the Chicago Historical Society a copy of his Red Man's Rebuke. With it, Pokagon included a letter that stated, quote, I am getting to be an old man and wish to leave this greeting with you that it may be read by future generations. I heard my father say many times before and after he was converted to Christianity, if there had been no whiskey, there would have been no Fort Dearborn massacre, end quote. Pokagan was reiterating this point at the end of his narrative, emphasizing the destruction that alcohol had wrought on his and other native communities. In his narrative of the massacre, Pokagon highlighted his own research into the account books of the American Fur Company, which were kept at the Astor House on Mackinac Island. In these records, Pokagon found instance after instance of traders paying native hunters for animal furs with whiskey rather than money or other practical goods. For Pokagon, this signaled the larger, more systemic problem. U.S. settler society was not simply using alcohol as a trade good with which to acquire native resources and lands. Alcohol was a tool of genocide. Pokagon saw this and he wrote about it extensively. For him, the entire blame for what happened at Fort Dearborn should be placed squarely on the traders and the government agents who sought to use alcohol to manipulate the Potawatomi and other native peoples of the Chicago area. Fort Dearborn in the early 19th century was the place where US officials sought to manage Indian affairs, direct the flow of native trade goods, and undermine British native relations in the Great Lakes region. For Pokagon, Fort Dearborn was also the place where white men pushed alcohol and addiction on native peoples who were clearly better off without it. When Captain Nathan Heal broke his promise to deliver the garrison's alcohol and ammunition to the Potawatomi, instead destroying it by dumping it in the river by cover of night, he called for the destruction and the destruction of the garrison. Choosing the Battle of Fort Dearborn for the subject of his analysis, Pokega was doing much more than simply giving yet another historical account 
of an event that was familiar to every Chicagoan at the turn of the century. Kokagan's true target was the writing of history itself and the violence done to Native peoples by non-Native historians who claimed a monopoly of the narrative. Kokagan made this clear when he stated, quote, in a book published at Chicago in 1893, entitled The Chicago Massacre of 1812, I find this statement. Here was the native savage, not ignorant of wiser ways, for he had thrifty white man under his eyes for four generation, still showing himself in sense a child, in strength a man, and in cruelty a fiend incarnate, end quote. Hokagan had his work cut out for him indeed. He continued though by stating, quote, the author certainly must have been ignorant of the fact that those white men with whom our fathers had to deal were generally of the basest class. Our traditions and the accounts published by the dominant race show conclusively that the white man's dealing with our fathers was of such a character that they were made much worse instead of better. And Pokagan calls on heaven to witness again that in many battles before and after the Chicago massacre, there was far less mercy and justice shown our race than our fathers exhibited toward the garrison at Fort Dearborn, end quote. 80 years after Simon Pokagan's death, eminent anthropologist James Clifton declared himself the expert on everything Potawatomi, including the Pokagans. In his 500 page uh, opus, The Prairie People, Continuity and Change in Potawatomi Indian Culture, 1665 to 1965, Clifton expressed deep skepticism of Pokagan's literary contributions. Clifton wrote of Pokagan, quote, he had become a very considerable celebrity in an age when Indians believed to be disappearing as a culturally distinctive population once more started to come back into popular consciousness, but only if they were good Indians, end quote. Clifton attacked Pokagan's writing style, stating that it bore no relationship to traditional Potawatomi literary style, form, or content. In fact, Clifton went so far as to discredit Pokagan as a writer completely. In Prairie People, Clifton scathingly claimed that Pokagan was little more than literate, with his creative writings being the result of a collaboration with the imaginative wife of his editor, C.H. Engel. Clifton boldly accused Engel's wife of ghosting Pokagan's essays, poems, and novels, a claim which he substantiated with just a single footnote referencing only four different works. Those sources included David Dickinson's Chief Simon Pokagan, The Indian Longfellow, an article which was published in the Indiana Magazine of History, a self-published book by Everett Claspie entitled The Potawatomi Indians of Southwest Michigan, Frederick Hodge's Handbook of American Indians of North Mexico, published by the Bureau of American Ethnology Bulletin, and then an article by George Quimby entitled, Some Notes on Kinship and Kinship Terminology Among the Potawatomi of the Huron, published in the papers of Michigan the Michigan Academy of Science, Arts, and Letters. Because of the weight of Clifton's credentials, scholars did not begin to dig deeper into the life and writings of Simon Pokagan until the turn of the 21st century. However, such a dig, beginning with Clifton's shoddy source work, reveals that Pokagan was a man who defied the stereotypes and categorizations of non-Native authorities. Of the four sources Clifton cited in his treatment of Simon Pokagan, George Quimby made no reference to Pokagan whatsoever. Hodge's encyclopedia-like reference included only glowing praise for Pokagan as having, quote, bore the reputation of being the best educated, full-blooded Indian of his time, end quote. Dickinson similarly described Pokagan in positive terms, stating that he was, quote, sorely troubled by the social and economic difficulties confronting the Indians of his generation, and he was deeply sensitive to the romantic virtues and beauties of unexploited nature, and his affection for his ill-starred family is poignant and personal, end quote. Dickinson did, however, assert that Pokagan's rhetoric was based on white romanticism and it, quote, weakens the vigor of his English style and disappoints a modern reader, 
one feels that he is not speaking with the spontaneous voice of his own primeval culture, but rather is borrowing the white man's 19th century cliches, end quote. However, Dickinson still insisted that Queen of the Woods was a unique document from a genuine Indian source, an emotional and at times lyrical remembrance of things past rather than a synthetic sterile exercise such as Hiawatha. Clearly, Dickinson was not giving uh, Clifton the evidence to support a ghostwriter. In fact, of Clifton's four sources, only Everett Claspey could account for Clifton's rejection of Pokagon's authorship. However, in actually looking at Claspey's work, he merely stated, quote, the mid 20th century Potawatomi leader, Michael Williams, was of the opinion that the wife of Engel had a lot to do with Pokagon's literary output, end quote. Clifton took this comment on editorial contribution to mean that Engel's wife definitively ghosted Potawatomi's writing or Pokagon's writings. In fact, Pokagon was borrowing the white, in fact, Pokagon was borrowing the white man's cliches, but he was doing so for his writings to resonate with a white audience. Pokagon was selling to his audience an alternate history, one in which native peoples did not disappear, were not incapable of adapting to the changing world around them, and had the ability and the right to control their own representation. A decade after Prairie People, Clifton wrote a book entitled The Pokagans, which was meant to aid the Pokagon band in its quest for federal recognition. However, again, he took it as yet another opportunity to argue that Simon Pokagon's semi-autobiographical book, The Queen of the Woods, was ghostwritten by Engel's wife. This time in support of his defaming remark, Clifton offered no source references. That the supposed foremost expert on the Pokagans continually made such base claims about Simon's authorship with zero evidence to back it up was striking. For Clifton, it seems that Pokagon simply did not fit the mold of traditional Potawatomi culture, and thus his contributions were at best dismissible and at worst a hoax. And so Clifton, a white authority on indigenous peoples, sought to re-erase the aberration of a native author who had fought so hard against the violence of native erasure from the public narrative. Clifton eventually ran into trouble when, in 1990, he published an edited collection titled The Invented Indian, Cultural Fictions and Government Policies. Clifton and a host of his colleagues essentially wrote a book asserting that they had more authority to speak on behalf of Indians than Indians did themselves. In this work, Clifton contended that works about Native peoples by Native scholars, or even by non-Natives who collaborated with Native scholars, should be dismissed as partisan and biased. Instead, Clifton argued that sound scholarship could only be conducted by rigorously trained non-Native academics who were distanced from their subject matter and could therefore employ a more objective viewpoint. In a review essay of Invented Indian, <clears throat> the notable Native intellectual Vine Deloria Jr. describes Clifton's work as a continuance of the structure of erasure the same one that Simon Pokagan faced two generations earlier. Deloria states, quote, for most of the five centuries that natives and non-natives have been in conflict, whites have had unrestricted power to describe Indians in any way they chose. Indians were simply not connected to the organs of propaganda so that they could respond to a manner in which whites described them, end quote. This is exactly what Peg Hagen was fighting for at the turn of the 20th century. And this is exactly what scholars like Clifton have been fighting against ever since. Modern scholars taking seriously the implications of native studies should see Simon Pokagan's work not as an aberration or a fraud. Rather, we should see Pokagan's contributions as a noble attempt to make assertions of self-determination and sovereignty. Pokagan fought first for recognition. In the late 19th century, as in the present day, Native peoples existed in the minds of Americans as static caricatures firmly ensconced in history. They were noble and ignoble, fierce and depraved, but they were connected to the natural world that needed to be tamed in order to make room for the spread of modern United States, and they were simply unable to adapt and remain culturally Native. <clears throat> 
Simon Pokagan attacked this type of thinking head on. When he stated, quote, what the white man writes, the white man reads and believes. They write lies about our race, about our troubles, and about our warfare with their kind. Pokagan could not have been more direct. He gave the world a representative of Native Americans that did not fit the mold. His very existence belied the myths that early U.S. history was founded on. Pokagan sought with each work that he published to prove that Native people were not destroyed in the process of westward expansion and industrialization, and that the legally binding promises made by the federal government to nations it recognized as sovereign through a long history of treaties needed to be honored. This work is ongoing, but there is optimism. So long as Native authors continue to write themselves and their peoples back into the narrative, the project of settler colonialism can never fully come to its desired end. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ludke. We really appreciated uh, your presentation and your talk uh, and learned so much from this. So I'll give everyone a chance to ask you any questions that they may have about uh, your talk. Does anyone have anything? Uh, you can also uh, type them in the chat and I can um, uh, ask them as well. I'll, I'll ask a question if I can, if I may. Uh, so Aaron, a great talk. I was wondering if you could, uh, I mean, I'm thinking about uh, Pokagan, uh, but also the authors he's responding to uh, like Juliet Kinsey and the times in which they're writing and what's going on between uh, indigenous peoples and, and, and white settlers at that time. So, I mean, how do we, can you, how do you contextualize, how do you think about that, right? How do you think not just about what they're writing about the, the Fort Dearborn uh, uh, battle massacre, but but what's going on in the in the country in terms of indigenous relations at the time then they're that they're thinking about these 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 events in the past right no that's a great question <clears throat> excuse me so yeah so 1890s right was the end of the indian wars it was basically when the united states military um was sort of able to say we have achieved a a lasting and permanent victory over the native peoples of the West. Um, we have reached the Western shore of North America and we have won the continent, right? Manifest destiny had sort of reached its climax. Um, at the same time, then the federal government had the question of what then to do with these quote unquote conquered natives, right? Um, we had been, we have a, this long history of treating with them as sovereign peoples Yet at the same time, we want to um, we want to make sure that we stipulate that they are not truly sovereign, that they are quote unquote wards of the state. And so at this time, you have a shift in, in mindset, right? One that was sort of conquest and treaties, shifting towards things like allotment and boarding schools, right? They want to break up uh, break up native communities. Um, and offer them ways to assimilate into American culture. And what that really means is um, undercut the power base that they had through legally binding treaties. If the United States has a precedent of agreeing that Native peoples are sovereign, that Native peoples uh, have the right to self-determination and self-government, um, that's going to be a problem when you want to do things like further take lands uh, for public use or to sell to private peoples. And so the idea was to encourage and uh, whether it's through um, allotment and trying to sell natives the idea of private ownership or through forced attendance in boarding schools, really sort of push this idea of American citizenship, of American identity onto native peoples, and then discredit this idea that they are still um, out there with these treaties that promise them uh, certain, certain lands, certain rights, and um, certain amounts of sovereignty. So that's the, that's the larger context. <laughs> In Chicago, um, 
at the time, I had mentioned that Simon Pokagan had won that, uh, that huge annuity or that huge uh, compensation of 100,000. Um, Pokagan and his band were also in the process of um, arguing that they had rights to certain areas within Chicago. There was a uh, Chicago, like so many places in the United States, had sort of geographically built itself out onto the water. When they did that, um, they were pushing their geography farther than it than it was at the time of the signing of that treaty. And so the Potawatomi, the Pokagan Band Potawatomi, very cleverly stated, look, we ceded the lands that Chicago was on at the time of the treaty. We did not cede those uh, filled in lands uh, on the water. We never ceded the waters at all. So those lands that you pushed out and built the city on technically belong to us. And so there was this long sort of back and forth in the courts about that as well. But for the, um, for the sake of this presentation, for the sake of this chapter, I'm really focusing on the idea of self-determination and, and sort of pushing back against all these narratives that were sort of underpinning, um, underpinning the uh, allotment and boarding school acts, which is native peoples are dying off anyways, so let's find ways to work them into America. Great. Uh, I'll um, take one question from the chat and then go to Dr. Higby. Uh, but so I have a question from Brett that he asked a little bit ago that was, what made you interested in Simon Pokagan? Was there a particular piece of his work that you found enthralling that made you want to look deeper into him? Yeah, so I, um, I started my research Again, this is sort of one of those long circuitous paths. I I attended well. I, I attended a summer. Uh, they call it a summer school, but basically, it's a fellowship at the Newberry Library in Chicago, um, where they have uh, a class that meets, sort of a long class. It's like five hours a day for four weeks in a row, um, and this one was on. Uh, it was native textualization, I believe. Um, but while there, because we only met half the time, the other half the time that we were there, I got to spend in the archive. And um, I had found a number of different things that made me very interested in Chicago's history. And so Pokagan um, was actually someone that popped up in my, my search for uh, really sort of native Chicago in general. Um, most of, most of my work at that time was was focused on the treaty era. So I was looking more at like the 18 teens to the 1840s and Pokagan came much later. But once I once I found his writings, especially the, the Newberry Library has a couple actual extant copies of his Red Man's Rebuke, which are printed on uh, birch bark. And um, I was actually able to hold it in my hand and flip through it, you know, uh, super nervous that I'm gonna destroy this incredibly amazing artifact. Uh, but yeah, once once I once I read that thing, and well, first I had to get over the um, the aesthetic of what I was looking at before I could start to dive into the words themselves. I was like, this guy is saying things that um, they really run counter to what a lot of like the the white writers that I'm reading about Chicago are saying. And so uh, it took me down a, a a much different path. My my dissertation, my dissertation ended up being a lot different than I intended it to be because of that. Great, thank you. Uh, Professor Higney, would you like to ask a question? Yes, thank you, Ashley. Aaron, thank you so much for this talk. I wish I had heard it 50 years ago when I grew up in Indianapolis and was taught there are no Indians in, in Indiana because they all left. And I argued with people. Because I, I, I had a neighbor who was probably in his 20s or 30s, and he claimed to be a Miami Indian. And he lived in that school district, School 70 in Indianapolis. And so my teacher, 
whacked me with a ruler on my hand for arguing that there were Indians in Indiana. Now, it was one of three or four times that I got physically punished for arguing against white supremacy in Indiana. I didn't have enough facts. So that's a comment. A second point, or an actual question, because this is a question and answer. Hokagan State Park in Northern Indiana. Are you familiar with it? A Little bit, yeah. Okay, I went there as a kid. I've been there recent, in recent years. There's now some signage acknowledging some connection to Native Americans. There was not when I was a kid. So the, the com combating the erasure has had some effects. Yeah. Uh, and beyond scholarship, but I look forward to reading your book and I'm gr very grateful for your talk. Uh, and that teacher that hit me, hit me with the ruler, she's in hell. Her name is Mrs. Lyles. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, Mark. Hey, Mark, did, um, <clears throat> so question, growing up in Indiana or going to school in Indianapolis, did you learn that, did you learn about the Potawatomi Trail of Death? No, I learned about that in college from yeah. Fred Hoxie. Yeah. So, uh, Yeah. Genocide I mean, is not a good topic for the curriculum right. in public schools. Uh, but uh, there's many things I didn't learn. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, great. Uh, Professor Murphy, do you have a question? Um, yeah, Aaron, it's so nice to meet you. I'm sorry that um, you didn't coincide with my time at Eastern Michigan. Um, so we have so many grad students in the in the audience, and I've really, really enjoyed your talk. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what it's like to research Native American history, and in particular, some of the methodological approaches that you employ in your research. Absolutely. So <clears throat> there's a lot of things you can do, right? And then I believe that there are some things that you need to do. So you can study Native peoples as merely an object of analysis. And for I mean, more than decades, for centuries, that's what people did, right? Um, again, white ethnologists, white anthropologists, white historians would look at these people. They would exotify them, they would romanticize them, uh, and then they would declare themselves authorities, right, over that history. And then there is um, what you should do. What you should do is acknowledge the fact that Native peoples are still around, that Native peoples' cultures have not disappeared, that Native peoples themselves have a right to their own representation and a right to their own story. And then you should find a way to work with the people that you're studying, right, uh, when telling their story. Um, that being said, Native history is, or any marginalized, right, the history of any marginalized group is um, a very tricky thing because what you're trying to do is find voices from the past that were not considered worthy of keeping. And so archival work is, is different um, than if you were studying non-marginalized peoples. <clears throat> that means that you have to be creative in your source work right? Um, generally speaking, what I do is uh, I just engage in interdisciplinary research. So I, I borrow methods from um, anthropologists, you know, I look for works by anthropologists, or I look for um, oral histories that exist. Um, and you can use, you know, tactics of upstreaming of really looking at cultures that exist in the present, or at least cultures that exist at the time uh, that some sort of oral history was recorded. And then you can try and extrapolate, okay, so this is what the culture was like at this given point, right? Understand the fact that native cultures generally are transmitted orally, right? 
um, from generation to generation to generation. And that being said, uh, there's not going to be nearly as much in the way of cultural difference in uh, Native peoples from one generation to seven generations ago as there is in maybe uh, United States or Europe, right? And so you can take you could take what you can sort of divine from those cultural studies and then apply them to Native uh, or to whatever sources you can find that talk about Native peoples in the past. So um, it is possible to, to glean Native voices out of white records. Um, it's just difficult. Uh, a lot of people also use material culture, um, archaeology, uh, material anthropology. Um, again, uh, to, if you understand the point of an object, if you understand an object's cultural significance, then when you find traces of that object in the archive, then you can say, okay, uh, these people were doing this with that, or these people had this here because of, you know, X, Y, or Z. For me, um, I'm fortunate enough that I am studying Native peoples that were writing themselves. So I have Native voices at my disposal. Um, it's not always the case, though. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. That's really fascinating. Yeah, thank you. What a great uh, kind of lesson for our graduate students uh, who are in, many who are interested in Native American history. Uh, wonderful. Any other questions, last questions before um, we end? Great. Well, thank you so much. Let me, um, can everyone uh, join me in thanking uh, Dr. Lucky? We really appreciated your talk and uh, learned so much about our local history and uh, Native American history. Uh, so uh, thank you for coming and uh, we will um, hopefully see you in person one day. That would be wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Bye. Bye.